the slide show. Does anyone have any questions while I'm clicking around? Um, yeah, a question about uh, taking like testosterone and what would the outcome be if somebody took something very anabolic like uh, testosterone and then did nothing but like run marathons and so they're uh, they're like hypogonadal, but they're they're offsetting yeah. it. It probably I, I don't have an answer. Uh, I've never seen. I, I love the question. And it, it, does the question continue, or should I just start talking? No, it was just because like the uh, counteractive AMPK versus the testosterone. So like, what would happen? Yeah, I think there would be a uh, you know again I'm I'm hunching at you, which is my typical practice. But I think what you would see is a a recovery rate that is very advanced, very accelerated recovery rate. And so you're, you're running a marathon on day one. And instead of having that, I don't know how many days in a row after a marathon, people are just sort of limping around, aching. And I mean, like the ultra marathon runners are not experiencing that. There's an amount of adaptation or maybe there's an amount of drugs that are permitting that repetition of, of loads, repetition of stress. But I, you know, like the tennis players who do testosterone to get back on the, on the tennis court day after day after day, they're not huge, right? They're not, they're not, they don't look like whole continuous Ninja Turtles, you know, minus the green part, all veiny and, and kind of bulbous. They're just, they're, the rate of recovery is huge and is, is rapid. And so my hunch is that's what you're going to see, where it's going to ward off the typical atrophy, the typical profile of protein turnover that you would see in an endurance sport, whether it's cycling, whether it's basketball is very aerobic and go watch somebody who's not on drugs and look at their little tiny neck and shoulders and then and then watch somebody who's loaded up on testosterone for rate of recovery and, and maintaining a form, maintaining a... A, a sort of a stature. And I think that's what you would end up seeing is this opposition of inputs, but the testosterone is going to overwhelm it. And we'll talk, not today, but actually on Wednesday, we'll talk about the interaction between testosterone and mTOR signaling and, and its secondary effects as it um, helps accelerate. Okay, I think this is where we left off. Sorry, I'm still, I'm still just finding where we are in the lecture. Does that, do, was, Patrick, was that sort of ish or something close to what you were? Yeah, I, I figured there'd be a, a counterbalance, but I didn't know if one pathway would just completely dominate the system. And Exogenous testosterone is a pretty dominant force. Now it depends. Is it like, you know, 100 milligrams and you're running you know, 10K every morning and half a marathon at night. And so, okay. So matters of scale, um, you have having a sense of proportion about, about, you know, what the inputs are, but, but it's, it's pretty easy to, to just put more testosterone into the needle. It's a little bit harder to, you know, hit those extra miles in the, in the marathon. And so I think you would see testosterone predominating, but I, all I have, I don't have literature to cite for this. I, what I have is observations of, of sport physiques in what used to be very skinny forms of this AMPK, 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 which AMPK is wonderful for aerobic performance. You know, there's AICAR, there's ICAR, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Things you can do supplementally and, and you, you're increasing aerobic capacity when you do these things. Do you shut down mTOR and do you shut on you know, atrophy and um, you know, autophagy and, and, and apoptosis. Yeah, yeah, you, you do. But you also, uh, your, your metabolism is better. You get mitochondrial biogenesis and, and your VO2 max starts improving. And, and so specificity of adaptation, um, when you start confusing your body's inputs, my hunch is testosterone is going to predominate. Uh, that's my hunch. Um, I, I can't show you the citations, but but you can sort of look at the the professional sports and and the history of physical form. You have to incorporate training 
you know, pe- people and Lance Armstrong, watch him do in his, in his, the peak of his aerobic career. I mean, that guy was doing some heavy lunges and, and it's, it's cause when you, and we'll get into this. Oh, I think like next Monday or something we have next week, I think and then we're on Thanksgiving break and we'll definitely finish M tour before then. But today we're going to do mechanical signaling and chemical signaling. And then Wednesday we'll do endocrine and nutrition and then we'll get into practical applications of m2 or we'll get into ampk and then practical applications and and so we'll, we'll be finishing m tour probably a week from today would, would be my guess but but as we get into ampk and some of the applications you'll see that aerobic training now i'm talking like elite athletes people who do a lot of training not just like oh i started exercise today and i've never done it before but i got a fitbit and i'm out walking and i'm doing you know, you know ball squats or, or you know whatever that's not the population i'm talking about i'm talking about the population of you know elite exercisers who have a history of training and and they're well adapted and it's a matter of fine tuning of let me dial this up let me dial that down let me tinker with some some nutritional variables and see if i can oh put some put a staircase on this plateau and you know get a few more feet higher in altitude performance right elevate my performance a little bit more where the partial pressure of oxygen is a little bit narrower at my height of performance that's that's the the demo that's a population i'm talking about the type of people the type of training the type of athletes and aerobic training sort of compromises substantially in 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 the more elite you are anaerobic adaptations, growth, anabolic responses, but anaerobic training isn't quite as destructive to aerobic training. Specificity of adaptation, yes, but aerobic training is, seems, the evidence suggests in the, physiolog- the uh, physiology, the physiological you know, findings support that uh, aerobic training is more destructive to anabolism than anaerobic training is to uh, boosts of, of aerobic capacity. I, I phrased that in a, in a kind of wordy, confusing way, but yeah, the point came across, I hope. All right. Um, anabolic cell signaling, part three, mTOR and its buddies, part three. Let me open up the chat box. And we already have questions. Do AMPK and MAPK act on Raptor at the same time? It's unlikely that you're running a bunch of anabolism and catabolism at the exact same time. They both act on Raptor and they both act on Tuberin, right? There, there's a lot of uh, sites that they're acting on. Um, but but you, you seem to be either toggling between anabolism and, and, and catabolism. It's hard to do both at the same time. Just remember things like um, glycogen synthase. Glycogen synthase and glycogen phosphorylase. You're going to shut one off as you turn on the other. You're going to shut off glycogen synthase if you're turning on glycogen phosphorylase. PKA is going to phosphorylate them both. And so having contradictory signals going at the exact same time I mean, it's like you're doing bicep curls and flexing your triceps. It's just, it's unnecessary expense of calories. It's unnecessary exertion. It's, it's, you know, and so what you want to do is get more efficient with these things. Now, there are counter examples. There's Deptor. You remember that one? That's uh, Press 40, PRAS 40 and Deptor. And Deptor is going to shut off mTOR, but it's also like turning on PKB and it's, and it's inhibiting apoptosis. And so, so there are interesting counter examples of a lot of these things, but in general, very generally, anabolism and catabolism oppose each other. And you can see that with PI3K PKB signaling shuts off PKA signaling with phosphodiesterase, where um, PI3K and PKB both seem to um, phosphorylate and activate phosphodiesterase and phosphodiesterase prevents PKA activation and PKA would be mobilizing stuff. And so, um, you know, carbs and fats and depending on where you are. And, and, and so anabolism and catabolism generally run contrary. Um, so I think that answers that question. So this is where we left off, right? Here's the last slide, the, the, signaling at a glance and this is this was our this was our end point 
of the previous lecture. And again, a lot of these little, uh, you know, like enzymes and and well, substrates and and um, sort of events, the, the ligands and the receptors and and all of these things, you, you'll start to encounter a lot of familiar faces when you look at this big crowd. It's no longer just a sea of anonymous letters, right? You're starting to be like, oh, I remember that character. I remember that character. Ooh, that's the really anabolic. Uh, character in this in this story and and a lot of the road signs on the map are starting to be hopefully starting to be a little bit more uh, familiar but remember mTOR is a very very tightly regulated I mean that's what a lot of this stuff is is just regulatory um, upstream activators and inhibitors and all this regulation um, very tightly regulated in the interest of preserving fitness we started this semester talking about like fitness and then we get into specificity of adaptation and and what is specificity of adaptation well it's our alignment with our environment we're trying to to sort of contort our physical and physiological form to be more compatible, more optimized, given its environment, more compatible with, suitable uh, to the environmental stresses, the environmental loads, whatever demands and stresses and contexts that we're, we are plopped into. We're trying to be more and more and more ideal. And with mTOR, think of fitness in terms of metabolism. We're trying to be metabolically fine-tuned, in key with uh, the choir, our environmental choir, and whatever the beat and the, and the key that, that your stresses are in, our metabolism is trying to be right in key with it. And whether it's anabolic, whether it's catabolic, whether you need mitochondrial biogenesis, whether you need um, glycogen synthesis, whether you need lipolysis and whether you need ATP built or spended and, and whether you need proteins uh, accumulated, you know, this protein accretion to reinforce a tissue, this metabolism is a key component of fitness. To be metabolically fit is to be enzymatically and energetically in tune with your environment. And mTOR, this is sort of the tuning fork of it all. It's, I mean, it's really this, the critical regulatory hub that's listening to all sorts of sources. Tons of extracellular things, events, whether it's load profiles being placed on a tissue, whether it's oh, cytokines, whether it is, you remember cytokines, little signaling proteins for things and chemokines and myokines, if you know, muscles releasing it, whether it is growth factors and, and you know, growth hormone and insulin and insulin-like growth factor, IGF, and whether it is nutrition, which is nutrition is gonna affect uh, some of these, you know, like PI3K signaling, if we're talking carbohydrate nutrition, like we're, we're looking at PI3K signaling, but, but we're, we're getting in touch with the metabolic environment. How stressful is it outside? We, we need to reinforce our cells. Do we need to save up our accounts? Do we, do we need to like break down some stuff and build up ATP? Do, you know, so that's fitness specificity of adaptation and fitness, mTOR is every bit as important as anything else we've looked at all semester in terms of, quote, fitness. Now, again, when people think of the word fitness, just walk down the street or go go ask a family member or a friend or uh, someone at Thanksgiving, you know, what does fitness mean to you? And they'll look at their abs like, well, you know, I could get back into my old fighting weight. You know, I just, I'm hanging on to a little, you know, people's definitions of fitness is not really the reality of it. You know, does the shirt fit you? That's what it means to a tailor. Um, tailor with an eye in it. Uh, does the shoe fit, right? That's, that's what they mean by fitness if you're going down to the shoe store. And with a human body, is mTOR signaling appropriate 
does it match the goals and loads and stresses and conditions of your environment? Fitness, mTOR, there's a really tight linkage here between the two. So that's where we left off last time. I mean, I think I just said different words from what I said last time, but on that slide, that's whatever. You, you get the idea. mTOR is tightly regulated and it needs to be because death is the alternative. You lose regulation and death starts stalking you, right? You can, you can, you can hear it like the ghost dragging its chains through the hall at night and, and the the kind of scythe like you know scraping again i mean this this is as soon as you get unregulated so today what we're going to do is immune and chemical function now you've had a great look at the immune system uh when we did what happens in tissue injury you know you have macro trauma and micro trauma and and what what happens with the immune system and and let's start with you know, platelets and resonant macrophages but then let's move into all of these um cytokines and 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 prostaglandin uh effects and and this big explosion of chemicals the your immune system response that plays in here right that plays in at mTOR so it wasn't just a one-off, right? It wasn't just, all right, let's talk about healing and then let's move on. Let's talk about injury and, and disruption of tissue and, and the regeneration model. And then let's talk about how that regeneration is happening. What are these chemicals, you know, interleukins and, and prostaglandins and, and what are these things and how are they working? So we'll, we'll talk about that. And then we're going to do mechanical tension, load profiles by themselves, just load profiles. We've talked about biomechanics before, right? In, in I think section two, we talked about biomechanics and uh, load profiles and, and what that looks like and integrins and titan and cadherins and, and the trampoline example of where are you jumping on that trampoline? Are you right next to the springs? Are you starfishing in the middle? Are you just as, as straight up and down as a pencil and you just poking through that trampoline? What, how, what is the engagement between you and the tissue, which would be the trampoline, right? The, the huge, you know, black cylinder of, of whatever it's made out of. Um, so that the, the tissue, the trampoline tissue that you're jumping on, what is the engagement of that load on the springs, which are things like integrins and things like, like Titan. And we've talked about a little bit of that, but, but we're going to get into transitioning from uh, what, what mechanotransduction actually looks like from the, the application of loads to what do those loads do inside of the cell? You know, we've looked at what those loads are and sort of the, the, the differing properties of loads and load profiles. How do they manifest change within the cell? What are the signaling cascades, mechanotransduction inside of the cell? And then on Wednesday, we'll talk about the endocrine system, which we just finished like a few lectures ago, and nutrition, which if you take nutrition from Van Ness, you'll have this great overview of macronutrients and micronutrients and their interactions with the body. We're going to talk about muscle metabolism specifically with nutrition and the gator you know complexes and rag gtp aces and and the different what happens and, and and why is a lysosome present in in these diagrams and 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 what what happens to the mobilization of of the mTOR complex in the introduction of of nutrients and and nutrition from a very different perspective than you have probably seen it before we're not talking about like vitamin a and antioxidants and stuff now well, very briefly today, we'll mention free radicals, reactive oxygen species as a potential chemical interaction with mTOR, but we're going to do nutrition in a very different way, in a, in a muscle metabolism way. But both of these are going to be Wednesday. Both of these are today, and we're going to start with the immune um, system, the chemicals, sort of non-hormonal stuff. And you know what arachidonic acid is, right? We talked about arachidonic acid in our second block when we were doing at the end of the second block when we were doing the breakdown of tissue now in a phospholipid bilayer in muscle it's it's pretty uh prominent it's pretty abundant in skeletal muscle i don't know 10 to 20 percent of that phospholipid bilayer in skeletal muscle you're looking at arachidonic acid okay it's a 20 carbon fatty acid, uh, polyunsaturated, 20 carbon fatty acid. And it's 
a bunch, you know, it's not all, but it's, there's a bunch of it in a phospholipid bilayer. And it's pretty abundant in skeletal muscle. And you know, disrupt the tissue you're going and doing, whether it's an injury, but let's say you're exercising, because we're talking about mTOR from the perspective of weight room interactions, tinkering on a preacher curl machine or a squat rack. And, and what, what program variables in an exercise routine can we tinker with to elicit this? Well, let's start with uh, you know, arachidonic acid, PLA2, as you know, phospholipase A2, is going to release this thing. Arachidonic acid. Cyclooxygenase is going to convert it into prostaglandins. Now, you know, uh, a leave or naproxen, naproxen is a leave. Oh, uh, ibuprofen, right? Advil or ibuprofen. Um, these are uh, cyclooxygenase inhibitors, right? Cox blockers, they're cyclooxygenase inhibitors. Oh, uh, aspirin. We just talked about aspirin recently, and you know how this one inhibits cyclooxygenase because we went through the enzymes, and it's a suicide inhibitor, meaning irreversible inhibition. Aspirin, irreversible inhibition of cyclooxygenase. The others are reversible. Um, aspirin is the irreversible one. Uh, ketoprofen, phenoprofen. There's a, there's a bunch of different drugs. I don't know all of them. I can't I can't name all of these things and. And, uh, but there's some of them are prescription only, some of them are over the counter, right? Now, Tylenol, Tylenol is not one. Uh, Tylenol has different effects for its analgesic response. And we'll get to Tylenol at the very end of the semester, we'll talk about it. But Tylenol is not an NSAID. Um, tolfenamic acid is something that I talk about at the graduate level, but you don't need to know it. But the only reason I bring it up here is, yes, it's a NSAID, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, but I talk about alcohol at the graduate level. And um, it, th there's evidence that if you want to relieve a hangover, that's the NSAID that's been tested that works really well. Um, the cyclooxygenase inhibitor um, that works very effectively. So there's a ton of things that can inhibit the conversion of arachidonic acid, this 20 carbon fatty acid into prostaglandins. Now, if you take these things, right, you're going to upregulate some other pathway, um, uh, lipoxygenase uh, pathway, you get your leukotrienes, and uh, that's, you know, asthmatic inflammation. So if you have asthma, I would not be taking a bunch of, a bunch of NSAIDs. But we talked about all of this in our inflammatory section, but today we'll talk about it from the perspective of cell signaling cascades, from the perspective of, of how is prostaglandin, how are prostaglandins uh, initiating hypertrophy, initiating tissue regeneration and remodeling? And what is the problem with blocking it? Now, the problem with blocking it in the last section, I just said, let's just talk about this very briefly. You know, is the it when let's just do all analogy, the kitchen fire, right? So if you come in and you don't take the sledgehammer, you know, if you block a lot of the inflammatory response and like you, you don't knock out the cabinets and get rid of the garbage appliances, if you just paint over everything, like, you know what, let's get the fiberglass in here, lay down some new shades, let's just paint over everything you miss critical steps of healing and now good luck being an athlete a year from now. Yet you're back on the court or the field or the diamond or in the water or whatever agriculture your sport takes place on. You're back on it or in it and you suck it, you know, two years from now or something. So why is that the case? So I said, this is the cell signal cascade. You know how this stuff works. But the signaling, um, what, you know, MEK, ERK, this MAPK, so extracellular signal regulated kinase or mitogen activated protein kinase. So if you look in the comment bar, uh, Juan was asking about AMPK and MAPK and, and was obviously well informed. You've done, your, you've done your reading and listening about the difference between AMPK, super catabolic, and MAPK, super anabolic. The MAPK pathway is what the prostaglandins are, are activating. And we've known this for, um, for a little while. Um, but, you know, these different, again, this is the um, 
aspirin, right? This is the suicide inhibitor, but we've known about this for a little while. Get back into the 80s and, and John Robert Vane, Sir Doctor, he's a knight bachelor, which is the lowest version of a knight. Oh, uh, Paul McCartney, you know, Beatles and, and, and Elton John, who is, whose probably final tour will last 10 years. Um, these people were like the highest level of knight. And John Robert Vane, this is the lowest level knight. He's like the visiting assistant lecturer of, of the knight world. But uh, I think the definition of knight has changed a lot since Game of Thrones type of you know, melee, melee, whatever battle. Uh, anyway, so this is, he identified how aspirin works, how it's suppressing uh, the production of prostaglandins. So this isn't new, uh, but when you start looking at beyond cyclooxygenase inhibitions, now we're getting into more modern research where people are still learning how prostaglandins become an anabolic signaler. But you have COX-1 and COX-2. I don't talk about this. I just say cyclooxygenase, right? But there's, there are, there's COX-1 and COX-2 are a little bit different. I mean, the protein composition is, I don't know, 60 something percent identical. You can look it up or, um, I think COX-1 is like 70 kilodaltons and COX-2 is like 72 or something. They are a little bit different. Um, but most of these NSAIDs, the ones you know about, pretty much every NSAID you've ever heard of is a non-selective COX inhibitor. And so that's why I just lump these things together. And I'm on tests, they're going to be lumped together. But you're going to see in a lot of diagrams or maybe encounter in the, in the literature, COX-1 and COX-2. And Cox one. So, if you know somebody who is who is a college athlete, right? They've probably overused. Um, I, I would just ask you know, Jesse or anybody else in the in the roster here, anybody else in class who who uh, is a collegiate athlete, and you've probably overused ibuprofen or its cousins uh, for for pain management. And there may be gastrointestinal problems uh, because of the blockage. Of, of COX-1. Now COX-1 is very abundant in gastric tissue. So it's like, oh, I have, I have so many, every single pitcher at one point, Jesse says. I have so many, I have like ulcers. I mean, like every soccer player I knew was just, man, their stomachs were messed up. Their gastrointestinal tracts were a disaster. Because COX-1 is very abundant in that gastric tissue. And those prostaglandins, remember COX, cyclooxygenase, we're making a bunch of prostaglandins, those have mucosal defense roles. And so if you're taking a non-selective COX inhibitor, you're knocking out mucosal defense and you're gonna wind up with some, some you know, GI issues. Um, and and I, I don't envy that. I mean, we all have issues. Nobody in life is without issue. If somebody looks like they have the perfect life, they're probably the, the most, you know, paralyzed by, by, you know, complications and they're just hiding it well. And so if you are an athlete and you're just like, man, my stomach is, is like a volcano in there and I, I don't know what to do. And I, yeah, I, it happens. Tons of people have this problem. And so non-selective cyclooxygenase inhibitors. Now, I'm not gonna ask you that level of detail on the test, but when you start encountering some of these things, I just wanna have peripheral characters. What, COX-1 and COX-2? I, 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 thought, I thought there was one guy. Yeah, there, there's two, they're sort of conjoined, right? They're, they're sort of like Siamese twins, um, but... <sighs> But, but this is just a little bit of peripheral character development on these things. Um, but so what you're going to see is, is this development of prostaglandins. And, and you can inhibit that if you inhibit, inhibit um, COX. But prostaglandins have their own receptor. Prostaglandins have a cell surface receptor. And what um, signaling cascade are they activating? Well, this is the MAPK1. Right, so you see extracellular signal regulated kinase or mitogen activated protein kinase. And one of the interactions that you see right here, well, a couple of things, let's say RSK, you have encountered RSK uh, before uh, ribosomal S6 kinase. So at the uh, downstream end of mTOR, there's um, you know, P70 S6K and ribosomal protein S6. And, and so that's, this, right? And this does a lot of things. Remember, it, it suppresses bad 
the B blah 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 agonist of death, BLC2 agonist of cell death, B blah, agonist of, of death. And um, uh, there's a lot of anabolic and anti apoptotic roles of this one. I mean, this is in MAPK signaling, and we're going to do a little bit more detail with MAPK signaling today, but this is the prostaglandin uh, signaling. But also, you see crosstalk upstream with mTOR. Now, what you don't see, um, because Raptor isn't on this slide, uh, Raptor is another place of, of crosstalk. So Raptor and tuberin, we're inhibiting tuberin, we're promoting a Raptor. There's crosstalk here. And there's convergence. Convergence at the downstream targets of mTOR, complex one, and I guess the downstream targets of complex two, if you go far enough, because mTOR complex one is downstream. For, you know, remember PKB, AKT or PKB is a target, is a downstream target of, of complex two. So sure, it's a downstream target of all mTOR signaling. But really, mTOR complex one, the hypertrophy one, the, the, the uh, protein synthesis one, right? The translation, link together amino acids, assemble proteins, build proteins, those grow, 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 that complex. That's mTOR complex one. There's crosstalk and there's convergence uh, with this. And that's the prostaglandin uh, signaling cascade. Now, again, it's raptor two. There's, there's a phosphorylation of raptor as well. And you can just call this the MAPK um, signaling cascade. Now, here's, here's a better look at it. Um, where you see ROS right here. And so you see the GDP and GTP. It's a GTP ACE. So this is a GTP ACE. And we activate RAF, R-A-F, RAF. So ROS activates ROF, RAF. And this is a kinase, OK? This is a kinase. It just doesn't have a K in it. Uh, but this activates uh, MEK. And uh, MEK is mitogen activated protein kinase kinase. Okay, that, I'm not stuttering here. That's literally what it is. Mitogen activated protein kinase kinase. And, uh, and so it gets a little bit redundant. And then you get down to ERK and this is MAPK, right? So, so um, we go from ROS to RAF to MEK to ERK or, or MAPK, and now we're doing a lot of anabolic things. Once we get to this step, we're really anabolic. So uh, if we're going to go from prostaglandins inside of the cell, we're going to go from process cell surface from the outside of the cell to the cell surface, or you bind to the cell surface to the inside, that relay race, that, that kind of phosphorylation cascade, baton relay race in, into the interior of the cell. Um, all I care, you don't need to memorize these things, mitogen activated protein kinase kinase. You don't need to do, I mean, this is too detailed, right? But what you need to do is MAPK cascade. That's what you need to know. MAPK cascade. And then you know, RSK is a good one to know. Um, so MAPK signaling, that's fine. Call it that. Don't memorize anything else in that little cascade. This is just, just like when I was talking about COX-1 and COX-2. There's more going on here. And if you're curious what's under that rock, let me show you. Oh, there's potato bugs or whatever the hell you call them, your, your you know, wood lice and uh, roly polies or whatever. Um, let me introduce, which is actually that, that's a reasonable name because, because there's a thousand names for that little bug. You know, you know that little bug that rolls up and for some reason it's cute, but if you probably put it under a microscope, it's like the grossest thing in the world and you'd, be, you'd find it hideous. I think the wood louse is its real name, I think. Um, but it's like potato bugs and roly polies. It has like a bunch of different names. So do all these things. All this shit has a ton of names, S6K or P70S6K. There's all of these different names uh, for all of this. You know, TSC2 is tuberin, AKT is also PKB, tons of names. Um, and so as I get more detailed into the mic, that doesn't mean you need to replicate everything I say onto the page. Right, you need you don't need to you know, replicate it, and and what people would say, and this is a terrible expression because it's actually meaningless. Like, oh, regurgitate it, ridiculous cliche, because regurgitation is like you you 
uh, you eat something and swallow it and kind of mix it up with your own sauce and your own stomach juice, all those acids, and you kind of cough it back up, spit it up, and 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 you have your own, you know, take on it. That's what regurgitation means. You don't you don't like put it in your mouth in a capsule and then take out the capsule and and you know put it in someone else. Regurgitation is your own spin. That's what you should be doing in life. You're like, oh, you're just regurgitating. Is is how people. Um, you know, condemn students. And what a stupid sentence to say. What I want you to do, what I want everybody to do is regurgitate information. I want to put a bunch of calories in you. And then I want you to reassemble those calories sort of in your own stomach, in your own innards, and then be able to expel them in a novel, unique you specific way. I want you to regurgitate this information. That's that's a compliment. I condone regurgitation as everyone should. Um, when I put a bunch of useless calories in your mouth, when I'm talking about this, and like this, and mitogen activated protein kinase kinase, you don't need to put those calories into circulation and, and, and spit those back up with your own spin on them. So you don't need to do that. That's just, oh, okay. I, I, I get it. There's, you're drawing out excess on the map. So that's the level of detail that I want you to know is the relevant, applicable pieces of the map, right? You don't need to know where a pile of dirt is on, on, on the map. What I need you to know is where the streets are. And so MAPK signaling and RSK and, and the points of interaction, right? Tubrin and, and Raptor and, and bad and, and you know, um, glycogen synthase kinase GSK, um, but I'll, we'll talk more about that one. Uh, remember PI3K and P10 um, phosphatase and tensin homolog, this, um, this, uh, they do the opposite thing. Um, so when you have a kinase and a phosphatase, we have, we have, we have uh, the, where we're either attaching a phosphate or removing a phosphate. So when you see PIP2 and PIP3 going back and forth, that's what that's what that's showing right there. Now, Raptor as a hub. Raptor is a major hub for crosstalk. It's so important. Oh, I don't know if it was the first lecture on mTOR or, or the last, the most recent one, but when I'm like, Raptor, super, super important. Um, MAPK, uh, it's, it's important. Uh, the PI3K, PKB signaling, so the MAK, MAPK signaling, like prostaglandin signaling, so um, insulin signaling, PI3K signaling, this stuff, leucine, we'll talk about leucine, we'll talk about amino acid uh, availability, Raptor is, is, is a really important hub for these things. Now, since we're talking about the immune system and chemicals, right, we're going to do that one in mechanical tension, you know, these two are going to be uh, on Wednesday, but interleukins, um, so inter between leukin, leukocyte, right? Uh, I mean, part of the name probably comes from interlake and, you know, Switzerland, but interleukins, these um, 15, IL-2, IL-15, you see these things, these cytokines, these little proteins being abundantly released during times of tissue damage. Now, if you go for a walk, Right, you go for a walk around your neighborhood, or or yo, I just did a casual, you know, ride on the elliptical. That, that's not you're doing a lot of tissue damage, but you go to the gym and kind of work yourself into threat mode. Remember those pictures that I had up of of the guy? They're just terrible clip art cartoons of of the one guy who is disrupting the air. He's in the full sprint, and there's there's like wind trails behind him. Like if he's an airplane, those, those like contrails are, are, are trailing him behind and he's running versus the guy in like the scrubs and warm up pants and the terrifying smile is out for a casual stroll. You're not gonna get this big IL response from a casual stroll. You, you will get it from a ton of, of tissue disruption. But this seems to be critical, IL-15, IL-2, IL-15. These seem to be critical regulators of skeletal muscle repair and remodeling and regeneration, right? They're released. These things are released during times of tissue damage. And they are part of the regulation of tissue repair, just like prostaglandins, 
right? Those, those arachidonic acids, they're, hap they're happily, cozily housed inside of cell walls, right? Inside of phospholipid bilayers until you bang it up, until you make a ruckus. You're all roughhousing around and now they're released into the wild. And the more roughhousy you get, with your cells, the bigger the prostaglandin response. The more roughhousy you get, the bigger the IL-15 response. And when you look at like IL-15 increases myosin accretion in human skeletal you know, muscle. And overexpression of interleukin-15 induces skeletal muscle hypertrophy. And, you know, looking at wasting disorders, you know, sometimes we're looking at maybe mice or something. But when, when we're doing bench science models on these things, you can see um, IL-15 and hypertrophy. You can see prostaglandins and hypertrophy, IL-2 and hypertrophy, maybe interferon gamma. I mean, just like you could see Oh, insulin and hypertrophy, just like you could see uh, IGF and hypertrophy. But we're exiting the realm of canonical hormones, right? Classic endocrine uh, functioning. We're sort of in the immune system chemicals. I, you know, if you say IL-15, people are going, oh, yeah, yeah, hormones. People don't really classify them as that. And, uh, you know, when I was answering one of Jacob's earlier questions, and I, and I said, like, you know, what are the four upstream activators, these, these major categories of mTOR activation, not ke four chemicals or whatever, but four categories of mTOR activation. There's sort of non-endocrine, eh, whatever, there's endocrine you know, responses here, but non-classical hormonal glands releasing things into you know, systemic circulation and classical hormone um, signaling. You know, if you open up a chapter on endocrine signaling, they're not going to be talking about a bunch of like interleukins and stuff. They're going to be talking about like testosterone and insulin and thyroid hormones. And, and, and so it's up to you. You know, this is, this is not like, this is Courtney's take here. You get to have you know, whatever it is, the Kate take or the Patrick take or, or you know, the Jesse take, the Juan take, who, whatever take you want to have, you can. Mine is to separate these two because they're a little bit different. Um, the nature is different. Is there overlap? Yeah, there's a bunch of overlap, but I, I separate them. You don't have to. You can just say compounds, chemical compounds, and then you can say nutrition that's not that, and then you'll see stuff you chew into, into swallowing and circulation, and then you can say load profile, however you want to ca uh, categorize these things. Just because I say it doesn't mean it's law, Right, just just because well, Courtney said that's that's not me stating um, kind of indisputable, inalterable laws, you know. So, but guesses on the pathway for these things. If I if we were to be live, I would close my mouth and stare my blank face into your blank face, and I think you would probably get it right. It's much like Ti three K PKB. It's like insulin signaling. It's it's anabolic, classic growth signaling, PI3K, PKB, mTOR, P70S6K, ribosomal protein S6. I mean, let's just run down that highway. I mean, that's I5. That is the I5 of mTOR. If you want to go, let's say Canada is outside of the US because it is. <clears throat> that's outside of the cell. The US is a cell. Okay, the US is a cell. And let's say Let's say LA is sort of like ribosomal, you know, activity. I-5 goes from Canada. You're, you're at the border. You come into the U.S. and Washington, right? And then, and then you're going to go through some major hubs along the way, right? So, you know, Tacoma and Seattle and, and whatever. And you go through Portland and, and Eugene. And, and I guess I'll consider Ashland because of the Shakespeare Festival, uh, uh, or Medford or whatever. And then you, you go through Weed and maybe Weed, Oregon, or Weed, I don't know, Weed in California. Weed's California. Weed, and then that's like Reb, right? And then you get to, I don't know, what the hell, Redding or something, and, and, and Sacramento. There's major hubs along I-5, Humboldt, 
<laughs> Humboldt. Uh, there's there are major hubs. This is this is PI3K, PKB, MTOR, and yeah, there's there's big cities. I, I don't know what Sacramento or Portland or Seattle or something like that. I, I would say is is like PKB. I mean, that's a major hub and 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 mTOR is like the biggest hub there. But but I think you get the idea of the visual. This is a map that we're talking about, mTOR. This is a huge map with roads going everywhere. And and some roads go are going in the exact same place. And there's 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 like access roads and these two roads are like one's parallel to the other, the MAPK road and the PI3K PKB road. There's a parallel. Like they're just going to the same place, right? But but PI3K PKB that in terms of, of muscle hypertrophy and regeneration and growth, that is I-5 to hypertrophy. And there are major cities along the way. And the major cities, those capitals, that's what I, really what I want you to know. And some of the mi minor cities, the Humboldts, right? I want you to know some Humboldts um, along the way too, sort of the Rebs and stuff. Now, here's IL-2. And there's a lot of... of uh, activity that, that you'll see IL2 doing. But, um, you know, there's JAKSTAT, right? We talked about growth hormone and JAKSTAT, but IL2 and PI3K versus P10, right? PI3K is converting PIP2 into PIP3. We have a little docking station. Technically, PDK is not on here, but AKT or PKB, I like how they did that. AKT or PKB, and then downstream, and, you know, <laughs> PKB pathway, it says, which is good enough. That's fine. And so we, we see this classic I5 signal for immune chemicals. For immune chemicals, we're going to see that. And when you see IL-15, you're seeing this a similar thing. Um, there's PIP2 to PIP3. And this is nice because you do see the PDK to PKB and AKT to PKB. And study. when it says uh, forkhead, box O, forkhead, that's FOXO. Let's shut that off. Uh, bad, right? B, agonist of death, BLC2, um, agonist of cell death. Uh, and so we're shutting that stuff off. We're also shutting off glycogen synthase kinase 3, which is shutting off glycogen synthase. Um, and so this isn't like we're shutting off the synthesis of glycogen. Not true. We're turning on the synthesis of glycogen by turning this thing off. So the name can be a little bit confusing right here. Um, just as like Yolo County doesn't make any sense for its current iteration of a cliche. And weed, I don't know, does or doesn't make sense. I'm not sure. Um, so sometimes the names of these things can be a little bit misleading. Glycogen synthase kinase, like, okay, we, we're not, when we're shutting this thing off, that means we're, we, can, we have the ability now to make um, uh, glycogen. And then this, I, I don't really like how it says this, right? PKB to P70 SSK. Well, as you know, there are multiple steps here, right? Where the hell is tuberin? Where the hell is Reb? Where the hell is mTOR? Where the hell is Raptor? You know, and so, and so there's some there's some uh, missing steps along the way. But IL two, IL fifteen, you see these same uh, immune system cytokine signaling protein. These same these same players with signaling cascades that are upstream. Now you should start to recognize stuff on here. Glute, right? Obviously, we're talking glute four. Yeah, there are a bunch of glutes. We're talking glute four, um, hexokinase and PFK, right? So, so over here, let, let's let's talk about um, glycolysis, and there's glycogen synthase kinase. You, you, you've seen that. Um, FKBP12. Remember mTOR's other names, Raft one, and and FRAP. Um, and so RAF with the F, FKBP12, and FRAP with the F. Um, so uh, that's what rapamycin is is interacting with. And we'll, that one will come up again today. But um, Raptor, mTOR complex one is the kinase, right? mTOR complex one is a kinase. And there's Gable or MLST8. And we're, we're halting autophagy. And we're, we're, we're activating P70S6K. And go ahead and put right here. RPS6, ribosomal protein S6, on the way to translation. This is growth. This is protein translation. This is uh, anabolism. This is uh, you know, the creation of proteins that goes to your hypertrophy. This is protein turnover favoring anabolism. You know, there's only so many different ways I can phrase that. Um, but but you, I'm just saying the exact same thing over and over. 
And so the raptor regulatory associated protein of TOR, raptor is recruiting these downstream targets and mTOR, the kinase, mTOR complex one, there's a bunch of proteins in that complex, right? But the mTOR itself is a kinase, which means it phosphorylates things, it attaches phosphates to things. mTOR is phosphorylating these things and that shuts off this and that turns on this. And so now we get to grow. So you see insulin, insulin receptor substrate, right? You saw ROS, MAPK, you're, you're familiar with those things. But the PI3K, look at all these inputs. I mean, you're just, uh, all of these, I mean, uh, I don't know, Canada and <laughs> Greenland, I don't know, whatever. a bunch of stuff feeds in to the PI3K road, right? Um, phosphatidyl and nosotol 3 kinase. Do you need to recall that from your head on the test? No, but it's a kinase. And through this, we are activating uh, PKB through PDK, right? So we're converting PIP2 into PIP3. Um, so it's chemokine receptors. This is interferon gamma, interferon gamma. Um, there's your IL2. Um, and, and like CD28 cluster of differentiation 28, um, it's on the, the surface of, it's, a, it's on the surface of T cells. So I, I'm not going to talk about, um, either of these things, right? So this is like a T cell receptor and, and CD28, not going to talk about either of these, but IL2, you should know and interferon gamma you should know those two. And you already know, uh, you know, whether it's like IGF, things like that, insulin-like growth factor. And you already know uh, insulin um, and how that works. Now, you see AMPK over here, not MAPK over here, MAPK, super anabolic parallel road to I5. But over here, you see AMPK really, really catabolic. Um, let's turn on tubrin, right? Let's turn this on. Now, PKB is shutting it off. AMPK is turning it on. And tubrin is inhibiting REB. And REB, GTPase, it needs its GTP. Um, if this is active, you're, you are hydrolyzing um, the GTP, you're making it GDP. So a REB can't activate uh, mTOR. So if you're turning on tubrin, you're shutting off REB. You're deactivating REB. If you're deactivating REB, you're not activating mTOR. If you're not activating mTOR, well, you're, you are degrading proteins and you're, you're halting translation. You're not turning on translation. So a lot of these things are starting to make sense, are starting to at least be familiar. When I say the words and you look at those little abbreviations, you see AKT and you automatically know it's PKB and then it's anabolic and that this is an upstream activator and the canonical signal, the primary uh, chief road of mTOR activation. A lot of this stuff is, is I, I hope, starting to be very familiar vocabulary um, that, that, you know, maybe not, you're not fluent in mTOR, but like I can get by, you know, I, I can ask where the Toshio Khan is, sort of a library in, in like I, I did Japanese for years and I, I know like nothing. Um, it's it's at once I would have said like oh, I can get by in Japanese and I would have been exaggerating my my talent, but uh, as as you recognize vocabulary and you can put it in order, that's getting by in a language. You know, you know how to ask oh Ringo oh oishi das nay <laughs> what are you like you know the apple is delicious or um. Daska is would be the question I, where, where you can start putting words in the right order, but you sound like a fool. You know what I'm talking like if I try to say something in Japanese and anybody else here speaks Japanese, like Courtney, you're an idiot, is, is what goes on in your head. Like you pronounce things wrong, your word order sounds silly. Um and you know, Toshiokan, oh ikimas. Like I think there was a grammar error in there because I don't think it's oh, but that's as good as I can do. Um and that's, I think, where, where every single student 
probably is an mTOR now, which is like, okay, you're getting vocabulary down and you're putting it in the right order, right? Is the grammar quite there? No, and I don't expect it to be. Um, and it, is, your, is your vocabulary, you know, as big as the whole dictionary? No, and I don't expect it to be. But to be able to get by in the language is, is really what we're hoping for. Um, can every mTOR complex one inhibitor be considered catabolic? I wasn't gasping. I was like, that was like a indelicate hiccup. <laughs> it's like the question was, I'm so taken aback by the question. Uh, I, yeah, I think so. I, now, I... I'm going to answer that question with some qualification that that I, probably depends on contexts of of you introduce one inhibitor, but over here you have a massive promoter go in, and and so maybe the inhibition doesn't take effect, right? That hook doesn't set, and you're kind of real. Uh, but for the most part, you can say uh, every. MTOR, you, you can reasonably say that. Um, I just wouldn't be super bold and yell it from a veiny throat that, that every mTOR complex one inhibitor is catabolic. I, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a, a muted yes as, as an answer to that, because there probably are contexts in which, in which that is not quite completely uh, true conditionally. Um, <sighs> But I don't know. I hope that I hope that kind of I hope that badly answers your question sufficiently. Uh, interferon gamma, another side, another side of kind of interferes, right? Interferon it interferes with viral, viral replication. So interferon gamma, um, you know, endogenous interferon gamma is required for for um, efficient skeletal muscle regeneration. When we're looking at some of these other other immune chemical components interferon gamma is, is another one where where just go bang up tissue and you get all these prostaglandins you get all these uh, the all these cytokines show up and 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 they're going to a lot of them not all of them a lot of them are going to positively uh affect hypertrophy to promote uh mTOR signaling now myostatin does the opposite it's uh, myokine, which means like it's a cytokine that muscle is making. Myo, muscle, kine. Now statin, myostatin, stasis of muscle. Um, and so myostatin, when you look at it, and remember like folostatin is the binding protein for myostatin, which will inhibit its effects. So for myostatin, you have folostatin as its binding protein, which stops its, its interaction. Um, so, so folostatin would be anabolic, myostatin would be catabolic. But you see the effect here on PKB, AKT or PKB. And, and over here, you know, rapamycin, right, mammalian target of that thing, uh, of that big you know, macrolide, of that, of that big carbon hunk of, of you know, stuff. Um, and mTOR and Raptor, now they've left out Gable, but if you're going to leave out one of them, that's the one to leave out, right? Tom Cruise doesn't have to be in the cast because he's, really, he's not really serving a role here. He's just sort of an extra. Tom Cruise is an extra in this movie. Um, Lestat, right? Lestat de Lioncourt. M Lestat, meaning MLSD8 or Gable would be the exact same uh, thing. And downstream from mTOR complex two, rapamycin insensitive. Now it's not entirely insensitive and we'll get to that later, uh, but it's acutely rapamycin insensitive. It is not chronically insensitive. This is acutely affected by uh, rapamycin downstream target is PKB. Um, but here, this is, it's, it's a nice um, look where PI3K is converting PIP2 to PIP3. Uh, PIP3, this docking station. Um, now PDK is actually what's activating PKB uh, in the presence of that. And uh, so the only thing I need you to know about myostatin is inhibition of PKB. Myostatin, inhibition of PKB. And differentiation of myoblasts, is it affecting that? Yes. And so you're not getting mature fibers. Fine, sure. But that's a peripheral uh, effect of myostatin to what we're talking about here, which is hypertrophy growth of, of sort of mTOR-regulated 
uh, protein turnover. And so the only thing I need you to know about myostatin is, is PKB activation and folostatin is an inhibitor, which makes it a promoter. So folostatin is a binding protein that would be a promoter of growth, right? Now, TNF-alpha, tumor necrosis factor. Now, often contemporary literature, right? This is 2009, which isn't that long ago, but if you see something from 2019. Um, and this is a, a seriously wonderful article that has a couple of time, sort of anachronistic, kind of out of time labels of things. And, and TNF-alpha or TNF, tumor necrosis factor, fine, whatever you want to call this thing, you'll, you'll, you'll see it appearing in the literature. And this also has anabolic roles, but it's messy. TNF is, is, is a little bit messy. Uh, but what its effect is going to be, and the activation of mTOR complex one, and you can see that there. So if you just follow the arrows, um, you'll see it and maybe you know, draw a line with glycogen synthase kinase and not have it be you know, promoting. Um, and over here, the Wnt proteins, you remember this, the Wnt proteins, uh, right before we talked about Sonic the Hedgehog, which we'll never bring up again. Uh, the Wnt proteins have an interaction with mTOR, glycogen synthase kinase, right? Let's, let's inhibit glycogen synthase kinase the Wnt pathway inhibits glycogen synthase kinase. And remember, glycogen synthase kinase is turning on tuberin. It's turning on that, that um, tuberous sclerosis complex, which is shutting off REB. So if Wnt proteins uh, going through frizzled and disheveled, right? if, they, if they go through, I think that the nomenclature here, there's a lot of like bug, a fly, um, studies and 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 I think if you look up just like AKT is like a mouse uh, when you look up the nomenclature of some of these things like man that is a disheveled fly I mean, you'll you'll see some narratives in, in some of these things with with hedgehog it was just sort of like nerds which I'm totally pro nerd I'm I'm among them they're just they're like smarter than I am at this if they're identifying um, these sort of ligands and signaling cascades and stuff. I'm talking about what what they are outlining um, for the world, and so they get to plant the flag, and and good for them for calling it Sonic the Hedgehog, <laughs> um, Sonic Hedgehog. But um, so winch proteins are a promoter uh, of mTOR by by inhibiting GSK3, which was uh, previously promoting or would otherwise be promoting uh, mTOR. Now I, I'm not going to ask about this stuff on the test because it just gets weird um, when you're looking at uh, reactive oxygen species, the stuff you take your vitamins, you know, C and E, and, and, and you're taking these antioxidants to ward off your whatever's lycopenes or whatever. And you're taking these things to, to ward off. Your reactive oxygen species serve a role in the body. They, they, they have an effect. And do they contribute potentially at high levels to acute fatigue? Yes, that's been seen, right? You, you, can, you can take um, these scavengers, you, you can, you can you know, eliminate reactive oxygen species and see improvements in performance. All right, fine. All right. Yeah. But they're, they're important in terms of cell signaling cascades. And, and if you're taking a bunch of antioxidants around workouts, some of the benefit of those workouts is, is commonly suppressed. Um, whether that's improvements in insulin sensitivity or, or potentially mTOR signaling, stuff like that. It just gets weird, though, because they're, they, they seem contextual. And I am not the world's expert on reactive oxygen species and, the, and their diverse interactions with cell signaling cascades. So this isn't something I've studied at length. And I'm not going to expect you to have uh, any, any expertise in this, but it's fascinating. And the few articles I did read, which I'm just showing you here, of, of, of that we have regulatory functions of these. All right, let me read these. Are but there's a ton more literature on this, and and, and it's diverse in its in its effects. And and so I would not commit to like reactive oxygen species. Great, they're wonderful, or they're super harmful. Um, it's 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 a piece of the regulation. And the complexity extends beyond my capacity of my my um, previous literature, you know, um, delving into that depth. Um, again, so you know, 
ROS, which just means reactive oxygen species, it's a free radical with oxygen in it, right? Like superoxide. And, and um, so uh, this ROS mediated amplification of AKT mTOR signaling. Okay, sure, yeah. We, we, we see this in, in some situations, but it's it's a little bit weird sometimes because you don't always encounter this hypertrophic response from it. So just the, I take the, the when I put reactive oxygen species in this list, take it with a grain of vitamin C, right? Take it with a grain of, of salt as the cliche, right? But um, a bunch of cell surface receptors for these things, prostaglandins, you know all about that because we've talked about that at length like for half a semester. Interleukins 2 and 15, interferon gamma, the Wnt proteins, TNF, tumor necrosis factor, myostatin is a negative uh, regulator. And these signaling cascades work through MAPK and PI3K, right? That mitogen activated protein kinase and, and the PI3K, the I5, um, phosphatidylinositol, three kinase. But these are both kinases. They phosphorylate a ton of things. And those phosphorylation cascades lead to enormous growth. And uh, the bulk of this, again, is just arrow after arrow is going through I5. It's going through PI3K. Um, and then, you know, PDK to PKB uh, to, to mTOR, you know, to tuberin, to, to REB, to mTOR, to P70SSK. You get the idea of these major, these, these kind of um, metropolitan areas en route to cell signaling. Okay, so that's it for the chemical piece. Um, let's, it looks like we have like 10 minutes. So let's go through mechanical tension. I might go over by a couple of minutes, but just leave when you're tired, right? Leave when, when your ears have had enough. Um, yeah, the timbre of my voice and all these stupid words come in one after another. I have had it. Just, that's totally fine. There's no quiz today. There's no quiz. Um, I might go over five minutes or something. So mechanoreceptors. You have mechanoreceptors and you're, you're interpreting information about the characteristics of the load. When we did the biomechanics section, remember I gave that example about like you're an outfielder and Jesse is up to bat and he hits the ball and like you can run and figure out where it's going to land and catch it. Now do that in a physics classroom. How long does that take you to calculate Oh, the angle of attack, or if it's like a discus or something or whatever, the the um the height and the speed and, and whatever the trajectory is and what I mean, like all of these these variables that are gonna go into you know, we'll calculate where the wind is blowing. I mean, all of these variables that are gonna go into where an object lands, I it's gonna take forever to calculate with a pencil in a lab, but your brain just does it. And you just kind of trot over and catch the ball and then you're close enough, right? And baseball would be hard if the outfielders had to be, you know, have a PhD in physics to, to you know, use their brains to, to estimate in time. And the body is the best physicist there is. And <laughs> Jesse, the, the ball likely wouldn't make it to the outfield if, if I was at the plate. Um, so your body is a wonderful physicist and it doesn't stop being a physicist with crunching data about where a ball or a discus or or a rock will land right or oh is that car going to hit me or is that, yeah how fast is this car moving can i cross the street in time we're good physicists with these things and athletes are actually much better physicists because of what's called chunking they have of having a previous exposure if you know, the frogger example of going across crossing a street and cars are coming and going sort of the if you ever watched Seinfeld, the, the George Costanza Frogger episode, athletes are much better at these things with, with uh, chunking uh, variables. And, but physicists live inside of you. Every one of your cells is a physicist. And what they're best at is interpreting the information, the load profiles that you give them. Whatever application of loads, ah, they know it, they get it, and they relay a precise message indoors. Uh, mechanotransduction, they relay that message to the inside, and the cellular response is pretty ideal. Now, it's not what you would, what your frontal lobes say, I want my biceps to be bigger, I want it to be huge tomorrow, or you know, I want to have a vertical jump of six feet. Like that's not what they're going to do. So that's not ideal from the perspective of, of human subjective goals, right? But they're ideal for fitness. We talked about fitness at the very beginning of this lecture as, as mTOR is, is a critical regulator of fitness. 
the 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 mTOR enzyme should appear in your head every time the word fitness is used because metabolic fitness is one of the most important variables of human existence. If your metabolism were not compatible with its needs, with nature's needs, you would be dead very fast. And everyone else who's who kind of lacks mTOR governed fitness would be wiped from the earth and you'd start to stink and maggots would be crawling all over your body. I, I, it would happen very fast. Now, our cellular, the, these proteins, right? Mechanotransduction, there's your integrin, right? It's a trans membrane protein, meaning it crosses a membrane, right? So here's the cell membrane, right? Here's a sarcolemma, here's a cell membrane. You have a bunch of arachidonic acid living in there. There's a bunch of cell surface receptors living embedded within it. And an integrin is a transmembrane protein that relays mechanical information from the extracellular matrix, mechanical information from the extracellular matrix. You're jumping around on the trampoline out there and it's, relay, it's a spring that's relaying that information indoors to say, here's the nature of, of it. You should recognize like, all of this, stuff, like everything in here. You know what a cytoplasm is. It's like, here's all the, you know, the interior. And um, extracellular matrix. There's a bunch of collagen out there. There's a bunch of fibronectin, a glycoprotein. You remember uh, uh, when we were talking about fibrin, fibronectin cross-linking to form that provisional matrix that gets gunked up by um, uh, all of the uh, platelets that are gonna that are gonna show up to this. And so we all of this stuff. You know, there's actin. You know, actin in mice and alpha actin. In you know what that is, and um, so we're going to adhere actin to the Z disk. And so you know all of this stuff. It's all, it's all come up before. But integrins are really the most understood mechanotransduction proteins. But there's a bunch of stuff uh, that's going on. And let's get into like a cardiac myocyte just because I like the diagram here. But all of, all of these things, ECM, that's extracellular matrix. We were just looking. Uh, at that a second ago. You know what a sarcomere is. This is only half a sarcomere because you see M band, right? So the, the M line or M band. So there's the Z disc. And so uh, you'll have, see the color of Titan down here. You'll see Titan, um, that spring, you know, 30,000 amino acids right here, stretching from the Z disc to the M line. So we talked about the roles of Titan earlier, of, of, of this passive elasticity. And we talked about it from the perspective of kind of myosin stability and, and stretching um, these two. But it also is, uh, is responsible for some mechanotransduction, right? Titan is also mechanotransduction. There's your integrins. There's your integrins. And I've, I've mentioned these words before, but focal adhesion kinase, FAK, focal adhesion kinase, this is that point of relay uh, between integrins and the interior of the cell to, to send those signals indoors. Uh, cadherins, if you have an adherins junction, right? These are two different cells, two different cells. You have a junction between the cells. Cells communicate with each other. Cells are very sociable with each other. Cells, cells are not isolationists. They aren't on quarantine. Um, they're on the internet and, and they're communicating with their neighbors. And, and when one house has the music too loud, the other house hears it. Cells communicate with each other. And so we have these junctions um, and we have cadherins in those, uh, in those junctions. And catenins or catena, Latin for chain. Um, if anybody has done ballet, like the Chenet turns, right? You, you do these little chain turns where your head sort of like snaps and focuses and snaps and focuses and you sort of like twirling across the room. Um, so, so, you know, Katina, Katina, and this is, this is chain. And so that, that communication there, you know, the Z disc, um, oh, you know what a plasma membrane is and, and the costumere. A costumere is a sarcomere to the sarcolemma. It, it's a it's a bunch of proteins um, and glycoproteins, and it's connecting 
the sarcomere to the sarcolemma. You don't need to know what it is. This is just more like Cox 1 versus Cox 2. So, but you know what this stuff is. What I really want you to know for, the, for this, for the mechanical tension, Titan and Cadherins and Integrins especially, those three. And what we have, intercellular load, remember cells communicate cell to cell, Cadherins, intercellular load, cell to cell communication, cadherins, calcium adherence, right? Cadherins, intracellular load, you're within the cell. Titan, you know all about Titan. Intracellular, within the cellular load. Extracellular load, meaning from the extracellular matrix to the inside of the cell. Integrins, we're integrating the extracellular matrix, the yard to the inside of the house. So we have extracellular integrins, intracellular titan, intercellular cadherins. That's what I want you to know. That's big picture. And then really, we're just going to talk about integrins from now on. All right. But realize what the other two are doing. Easy test questions. If I say, what are intercellular or intracellular signals, protein? Now, there's probably more. Right, you, you know you know your diagrams. You can name additional proteins like nebulin. I doubt nebulin does nothing other than um, help uh, act and assemble itself appropriately. There's probably some additional roles, but I haven't seen you know nebulin outlined for its for its cellular signaling mechanotransduction roles. But it would it would not surprise me if in three years there's a bunch of of papers coming out about nebulin and cell signaling. So you know again, what I say is a state of evidence currently what is known today. Um, I mean, I'm sure papers have come out recently that I have yet to encounter. And, and, but what, what, what is known to my exposure today? And that's what we're talking about. Three, four, five years from now, is more going to be known? Yeah, of course. And, and maybe we'll have additional uh, mechanotransduction roles that have been identified. Because mechanotransduction is super important to the cell signaling uh, of, of growth, mechanical trans uh, tension may be the most important conditionally. That question earlier about if you introduce, let me read the actual question itself, can every mTOR complex one inhibitor be considered catabolic? And I said, well, conditionally, right? There's uh, under, under uh, yes, let's say yes. But if you introduce inhibitors, um, well, maybe not mTOR inhibitors, but if you introduce upstream inhibitors like a PI3K inhibitor, Wartmenin, a PI3K inhibitor, mechanical tension, this can still induce mTOR signaling. You can still get growth even in the presence of shutting down PI3K, PKB signaling. You can still get, get mechanical tension to activate mTOR. So um, that would be an example of earlier I said like, well, I don't know, conditions, and I just I was just vague, and I think nothing's coming to mind, but I'm sure there's a mind that has something that's in it at the moment. Um, my mind just, you know, this came up. But so the idea of integrins have their own signaling cascades that bypass PI3K. They do go through PI3K. Um, and, and when you look at, at Titan, right, its functions, we know the elasticity, we know that sort of template organizer for myosin and, um, you know, longitudinal axis and, and, and all this stuff. Um, mechanotransduction, it's also doing mechanotransduction. Now, transmembrane protein, integrins and cadherins. Titan is not transmembrane. Titan is, is Z disk to M line. Z disk to M line, that's Titan. Integrins and cadherins, these are transmembrane proteins. They, they expand, they, they extend into both sides, outside of the cell and inside of the cell. Now I have this little, you know, soft shell crab or hermit crab or whatever the hell that thing is. And uh, the reason that's there is, is think about the inside of its shell. You know, it's, yeah, let's, let's keep our survival bits. Let's keep our head and eyes and mouth and, you know, our organs or whatever they have inside of, inside of our shell, right? Let's, let's get punny and say inside of the cell, right? We're inside of the shell. And it has transmembrane proteins in the form of legs. It's feelers. They can watch, if people have these as pets sometimes, and I think it's weird because if, if anything has no personality in the world, eh, maybe they have personality. I just haven't watched them enough. But I don't want to be crabist here. Um, but 
they're you know all tucked up inside and then they sort of reach their feelers out and say okay what's the environment like what is the environment like outside can i come out and climb around and find food or is it dangerous out there right so they send their feelers out that's like a transmembrane protein that's like integrins reaching out from the inside of the cell to the extracellular matrix they are right, what's what are things like out here what's the environment like is it being loaded up is there a, a, a typhoon blowing around on on uh, out here and i have to relay that message inside what are the load profiles looking like it sends its feelers out of its shell um, so that's what these transmembrane proteins are doing is relaying information from the feelers to the inside where all the important stuff is where if this stuff gets banged up if a foot gets stepped on that's bad but that's not death right if this gets stepped on you know bye bye little cute thing um and you can think of your appetite in the same way you can think of your appetite in the same way that you can think of um a soft shell crab or a transmembrane protein <sighs> If you know, in I don't know, last lecture or something, with some recent lecture, I talked about the reason we have so much regulation on appetites. You know, where if you lose the nervous input, hormones will take care of it, whatever it, you know. It, and now, if you lose something like leptin, you'll, you're not going to find satiety. You're just going to eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. And so, but there's a lot of things that are going to are going to promote ingestion, and fewer things that are going to be an inhibitory to to ingestion. More things that are that are going to facilitate um, how much food can I get in my mouth. But if you lost one input for appetite, that's I like you have one faulty protein somewhere or something, and and that's it for you. You like never eat. Um, but what is an appetite doing? Well, it's like feelers. It's sending its feelers out into the external environment, clear out of your body. I mean, serious external environment. Like this thing's external, the beach with the beach glass, right? And all those weird, like, I don't know, seaweed, wet seaweed things. Um, and, and so it's sending out, the, it's like, okay, is food available? You don't really need food when you're hungry. You honestly, you don't. I mean, you can go a couple more days and you'll be fine, right? Um, but you don't really need food. It's just, I want to be in touch with my environment. I want to be fit to my environment. Is there food available? Let me give you a little appetite. Let me extend my feelers out there. And then if you put food in your mouth, that means food is in proximity to your hand and mouth. If you don't put food in your mouth, maybe food isn't available. Now I should start changing my endocrine function. Now I should start changing my sort of chemical uh, environment. I'm going to change my behavior if I decide food isn't available. I'm going to change my behavior if I decide food is available. And so there are arguments about meal frequency. There are arguments about eat when you're hungry, stop when you're not. Don't stop when you're stuffed. Right? Don't don't be like a maniac when when food. I go to the buffet and I got to beat the house. Right? Don't don't be. But there's 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 a lot of nutritional dietary arguments that have valid support in the literature about providing your appetite with a little bit of nourishment. Now again, now also there's there's evidence for fasting, and this is why I just don't get too much into nutrition because there's just every year it's something totally different. Every say, okay, now here's what we're we're advising, you know. And so, so I, I I like to build upon a foundation where that foundation doesn't get washed away, right? It's with the foundation on the you know sand stuff. Um, so I, the nutritional foundation, a lot of that just seems to be wishy washy, and at the real core foundation, it's it's not because it's chemistry. But uh, but you get the idea of of we have all everywhere in the body. You're sending out feelers everywhere in the body. It's the equivalent of a transmembrane protein. It's all right. I am inside and I'm reaching out to understand what the environment is like outside. We, I, you know, I talked about using cell phone apps. Right for a weather report, what's it like outside of the house? I mean, literally in, up in the clouds tomorrow, what's it going to be like? And we use a bunch of information and we relay messages. It's like a cell signaling cascade by the time it gets to us. You know, you're not the meteorologist. I'm not the meteorologist. I didn't make the app. I didn't send the information to the app people or program it or update. I, I, it, they're cell signaling cascades, essentially what they are. 
and and I hope these analogies work. The analogies are simply to illustrate it. I don't expect you to recall these analogies, or let's go back to regurgitate them. I expect you to regurgitate things um, as as a proper regurgitation should be, right? Where you have your own understanding, your own sauce mixed in with it. That's what that's what I hope happens. So uh, integrins, adherence, it's a bunch of signaling cascades, right? And so um, just same thing. You're, you're going you're gonna to see a lot of different diagrams, receptor tyrosine kinase. I've, I've mentioned that thing a bunch of times. And like, oh, kind of this. But over here, you see MAPK signaling, mitogen activated protein kinase signaling. Um, and so that's part of it. You know, with integrins, you're going to see part of that. You know, cadherins, again, it's cells are, are very sociable. Um, what this muscle cell is doing, this one understands, right? Maybe it's not electrically activated. Maybe there's a different motor nerve that does this this one's business that, that that is this one's boss but this one uh, it flexes and this one is not unaware of its of its contraction it's just not contributing maybe in the same way now going back to 2008 going back to 2009 right going back a long way what we're starting to see is mechanical stimulation of mTOR you know changes in muscle mass with mechanical load possible cellular mechanisms and keep fast forwarding 2011 2012 so it's been a good solid decade of consistent research on mechanotransduction and how mechanical loading affects mTOR signaling now remember uh, I hope everybody did this at home, the, the Alfredson protocol, where you're doing eccentric loading, eccentric, right, eccentric or eccentric loading, um, where you're doing this loading of one side, of one calf. Um, and so it's going to be gastroc and soleus, since both of them go through the, the Achilles. And but the, the goal of that lab was to go up with one, down with the other, up with the one, down with the other, or up with both, that's fine, down with one, up with both or one, down with the other, go down, 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 down with a single calf, go up, 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 no chance people did 100 reps, it says in the comment, but I think that's probably true, if anyone did do 100 reps, I haven't heard enough cursing, um, and maybe Cameron has. How dare you tell me to do that without ample warning? But the, the eccentric loading, man, that tears you up. But it's not, that's not down here in your Achilles. Where did you feel it? Way up out of the slide, right? Out of the perspective of the slide, just north of the slide, you're feeling, oh, your muscle's super torn up. Now that's a skeletal muscle and a giant inflammatory response. Tendons, that doesn't have inflammation. Now if you like cut up a tendon, if it's like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, okay, yeah, whatever, there's like inflammation all over the place. But but in your natural response to natural loads, tendonitis, right? Tendonitis. Itis means inflammation. That's not a real thing. That's a that's an invented term of an invented um, sort of fictional uh, ailment, right? It's that's just as real as anything in Lord of the Rings. So, um, how does a tendon heal then? Because we know, we, we went through all these immune and chemicals. We just finished going through immune system and chemicals and all the prostaglandins and, 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 and interleukins. And it, oh, we don't have that same signaling. And that stuff is critical. That stuff is critical for tissue healing. You need that stuff. Well, if you don't get it in a tendon, how do you heal? Mechanical loads. Mechanical loading is necessary. That's why the Alfredson protocol actually works. You need mechanical loading to initiate mechanotransduction, to initiate the cell signaling cascades that end in remodeling of a tissue. So when you see integrins up here, downstream from integ integrins, focal adhesion kinase, right? You see focal adhesion kinase. And what's this? PI3K. Right, you know, PIP uh, th uh, two to PIP three, and then uh, you know, and, and so we're we're going through this this, and then PDK activating P um, PKB and PKB to Amtra you know you know all this stuff, um, and so this is part of the signaling cascade, part of the signaling cascade of integrins. What else is there? MAPK. You know about MAPK signaling. We went through that in unnecessary detail today. So you know 
PKB, you know PI3K, and this is integrins are doing it. You don't need an immune system to do it. Integrins are going to do it on behalf of other chemical uh, compounds. Now, uh, FA, focal adhesion kinase, this is busy. It's a kinase, focal adhesion kinase. That's what the K is. Very busy. It's doing a lot of things. Um, but so far, in mechanical tension, we've gone through two of these four pathways that, that we'll be talking about of integrin related uh, mechanical signaling. And so it goes through IGF, um, insulin like growth factor. There's mechano growth factor. Just go lift some weights, apply some stress to tissue, and you're going to get just like there's a myokine um, uh, that's, you know. Uh, that's going to be inhibitory, right? Myostatin. There's a myokine that's inhibitory. You have, you know, muscle-generated hormones that are that are going to facilitate growth, and and so uh, insulin-like growth factor. It's a protein, a factor that that is is going to facilitate IGF signaling, uh, mostly local autocrine signaling mostly local and let's go through some pi3k pkb let's 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 go this canonical signaling but also over here we have mapk signaling so pi3k mapk part of that is just direct activation through integrins part of that in focal adhesion kinase right and part of that is going to be uh, mechanical growth factor, you know, IEGF hormone response. Part of that's going to be a hormone response. But then over here, you see DGK. There's another pathway over here. There's a couple more pathways. This is sort of the most vague, but this one lately has been outlined uh, pretty well. Diacyl glycerol kinase, DGK. Diacyl glycerol kinase. We've talked about like triacyl glycerol or a triglyceride, diacyl glycerol, a diglyceride, right? Monoacyl glycerol. When we're talking about lipolysis, the breakdown of a triglyceride, um, uh, we are lysing these, these um, you know, fatty acids off of the triglyceride. So a diacyl glycerol, you know what that is, but you don't have to convert it to a monoacyl glycerol. Right, and so what we talked about was like adipose triglyceride lipase, and then hormone sensitive lipase working on a diacyl glycerol and converting it to a monoacyl glycerol. But you have a diacyl glycerol, and you can use DGK to convert it into phosphatidic acid. There's a different thing that you can do here, and with mechanical stimulus you can facilitate that response. DGK, right? You can convert a diacylglycerol into, into a phosphatidic acid and phosphatidic acid activates mTOR. Now in the early literature, not that long ago, right? This was an amazing article, mTOR signaling at a glance. That's a huge, like uh, kind of daunting glance. Um, but that we ended last lecture with, but this is from 2009 and they're talking about PLD1, uh, this PLD enzyme. That's uh, that's DGK, right? So P, the, the, the earlier stuff, oh, PLD and stuff, okay. That's, that, that we, we're, we're outlining stuff in the last decade that wasn't previously known here, but how this stuff works um, leads to an enhanced binding of PA to mTOR and in turn promotes activation. That's how this stuff works. We, with, with mechanical loading, we can get phosphatidic acid. Uh, phosphatidic acid has, an, has a direct interaction, a direct interaction with mTOR and in a promotion way. And this is a mechanical loading base. So there's your diacylglycerol. There's your phosphatidic acid, right? It's just, it's just a, a slight conversion. So we have two fatty acids on this thing. Okay, it's not a triglyceride anymore. And let's use diacylglycerol kinase to convert it into phosphatidic acid. And FKBP12, right? It has also been shown that PA can directly bind to the FKBP12 rapamycin binding domain of mTOR. So um, phosphatidic acid, very anabolic and downstream from mechanical signaling is how you're gonna get that activated. Now this last one, this is the one that seems to be the known least in the literature, it seems to be the least information about it. And just like I say, mTOR complex two, there's not as much known as there is about mTOR complex one. And uh, MLST8 or Gable, least important, least understood uh, of, of the, 
um, of the complex of those critical complex proteins and, and of, of mechanical signaling. Sure, yeah, this is also um, the least important and the least understood. And it's also the least interesting. And so I, I have read about this one, the least. There's, there's interesting information about it, right? It, this stretch activated channel, SAC, stretch activated channel. And if you can get some calcium influx, you seem to be able to elicit uh, more mTOR uh, signaling. And if you introduce an SAC inhibitor, uh, a stretch activated channel inhibitor, you attenuate PKB signaling. So there's, there's understanding that it is a variable, that it is enhancing mTOR signaling. But like, I don't know, you see there's like air, uh, uh, question marks all over the place in a lot of these diagrams. Not that they like, just came out, you know, 2009 and you're seeing quite, but, but this, is, this is sort of the least, um, understood and seemingly important. Let's get some more stretch activated channels. Let's get some more calcium inside and you can do it. You can inhibit it and see less PKB activation. Um, you can promote it with eccentric muscle activations with, with loading and you see that you're going to get um, increased mTOR signaling, increased anabolism through the stretch activated channel um, as well. And then when you see stuff like this, you know, amino acids, um, VPS 34, that's a type of PI3K. You'll see that more and more. VPS 34. Um, so mechanical signaling, there's direct mTOR activation. So it's something close to direct, you know, you know, PA and stuff, phosphatidic acid, stuff like that. And this is indirect, you know, IGF, um, where mechanical loading causes the release of IGF um, autocrine signaling. So IGF release and it binds. So this is just one cell right here. We have like, you know, a single muscle cell and mechanical signaling binding to it. IGF release autocrine signaling. And now we get PI3K activation, the, the I5 to growth. And, and so there, but there's, there is direct activation that bypasses the highway. And there's indirect that uses uh, endocrine, which we'll talk about next time. So a question that you should be able to answer now is, is and I'll answer it for you, I don't expect you to, to answer it, is that why they say sprinting can stimulate hypertrophy? Sprinting, uh, they will, I'm sure, it's not the only thing I do. Uh, so that was, the mumbling was me reading the comment box. Uh, yeah, sprinting, we'll talk about this stuff. Uh, it does seem to be much more anabolic and uh, probably a lot more mechanical tension uh, than there's going to be endocrine and immune. And so I think you're on the right track here. And I have not seen the direct, let's break down the mechanisms of sprinting hypertrophy. I haven't seen um, anything that dissects it or isolates it or discriminates the different uh, variables about sprinting specifically, but it makes sense what you said that it would be more mechanical tension because there's, yes, there's an eccentric loading component and, and the weight loading and, 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 you know, part of the swing phase a little bit, but um, you don't seem to be getting as much immune chemical activation and so fast that you're not going to be getting like, oh, tons of growth hormone. And so the mechanical loading is likely driving a lot of that adaptation. Okay, so the question is, what happens to a tissue? What happens to hypertrophy? What happens um, to, to mTOR signaling in a muscle? in the presence of rapamycin. Now remember rapamycin, this is a sort of cute title, rapamycin, an inhibitor. Um, so rapamycin inhibitor, right? Target of rapamycin. Um, so rapamycin, major inhibitor. It's the inhibitor that mTOR is named after. What happens to mTOR and cell signaling in the presence of rapamycin? gone. It's just, you just abolish this thing. I don't care what the signal is. I mean, just study after study, they'll look at this stuff, introduce rapamycin and try to grow. Uh, not going to work. Uh, and so, you know, this is that big, that big carbon compound that is rapamycin, right? This is exogenous. This is not an endogenous thing. Now there's stuff like wartmenin, which is a PI3K uh, inhibitor. Um, you know, it's a metabolite of, the, of this fungus, you know, it affects pineapples, right? Um, wartmenin is a, is a PI3K inhibitor. Now that's upstream from PKB, right? So if you inhibit uh, PI3K, all of your immune 
and endocrine activation. Uh, you're just wiping this stuff out. I mean, not like testosterone, but 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 in terms of mTOR signaling, you're just knocking it all out. But mechanical tension can still get through. Right? Mechanical tension, because see again, you see VPS34. Remember I said it's a type of PI3K? Here's PI3K. You see Wartmanin inhibiting PI3K. Wartmanin inhibiting VPS34. It's a type of, of PI3K. Um, but... <clears throat> When, when you introduce Wartman in, okay, this canonical signaling of going into to mTOR, right? Here's the, the, the hub, Raptor, Gable, and mTOR. There's the hub, and P70XSK is downstream. Rapamycin is inhibiting it. FKBP12, right? It's, it's, it's inhibiting it. Um, there's uh, diacylglycerol kinase, right? DGK, and phosphatidic acid in mTOR, and, and um, and, you know, there's REB activating mTOR and tuberin inhibiting it. And, and we'll get to the RAG and the reason a lysosome is living. Like, what the hell is a lysosome doing here? We'll get to all of this next time as we talk about amino acids. Uh, but this is a, this is a, a type of, of PI3K. But a lot of these maps should start making sense to you when you start seeing these familiar uh, landmarks. Um, growth factors nutrients, right? Wartman is knocking this stuff out. Mechanical stimulus, mTOR, is still being activated. Rapamycin, sorry, uh, mechanical loading isn't even going to work, right? Yeah, over here, you, you're, you're taking Wartman and, and you're doing Alfredson's. Got it. You're fine. You got an mTOR signaling. You're taking rapamycin and doing Alfredson's? Nah. Uh, it's not going to work. Now, the last little thing I want to talk about, I'm sure I've gone way over um, at this point, and, and I have, uh, but molecular crosstalk between integrins and cadherins do reactive oxygen species set the talk. So when we start doing these two combined, right, immune and chemicals and mechanical tension, these have interactions. This doesn't work in isolation. This doesn't work in isolation. There is overlap. Now there's gonna be overlap over here when we start introducing this stuff too. There's gonna to be additional overlap, additional communication between divisions, between these totally separate domains of activation and regulation. But here we see stuff like integrin signaling, uh, producing reactive oxygen species, and reactive oxygen species seem to regulate functions of, of cadherins. And there's more to it. You don't need. I'm not holding you accountable for the more to it, right? Uh, I'm just saying there is additional uh, information. And when you get into stuff like leukemia um, inhibitory factor, you saw this exact same thing earlier. The sarcolemma. But you know what that is, phospholipid bilayer over here. Do you see the stretch activated channel? You know what integrins are. There's IGF, PI3K, PKB. You see tuberin, TSC2 is tuberin. Um, REB could live right there. There's your mTOR, 4EBP1, P70SSK. Um, there's your phosphatidic acid, except PLD. This is a little bit early, right? Should be DGK, diacylglycerol kinase. Uh, amino acids to, to VPS34, that's a type of PI3K. So you pretty much know everything on this. This diagram. You can show this diagram to somebody and say, I know everything here. Um, now, e e e uh, AMPK, um, so when this ratio, we're going to get to this. We'll probably get started getting to this on maybe Friday, but maybe next week. Um, as more AMP um, increases, you're going to be activated. AMP activated protein kinase is what that stands for. Now, LKB1 is going to be critical here. But um, but so you know, all you know, press 40, you know this thing. This is negative regulator. Now, Deptor is nowhere to be found. But but you're, you're getting all of this stuff um, down. Now, leukemia inhibitory factor, mechanical loading, to this thing, and then it seems to activate MAPK. Um, the literature that I've seen on this, which is little, I've seen very little, um, there's likely a lot more than I have gone through, but the literature I've seen on this is MAPK signaling in response to concentric loading. So a bunch of, of serials or repeated concentric loading, and then you see some you know, MAPK activation. Um, so that's what I've seen. But all I'm saying is there's crosstalk. There's, there's cross communication um, uh, between immune system, chemicals, cytokines, you know, prostaglandins and interleukins, stuff like that, and mechanical tension. There's, there's, there's overlap here. But the major points, just to review what we did today, Intercellular load, cadherins, 
right, that's that's um, mechanotransduction, right? From the from the inter, from the between cell to cell communication. Intracellular within the cell, not a transmembrane protein, but within the cell, titan mechanotransduction, extracellular load, integrins from the outside of the cell, from the from the extracellular matrix to the inside, um, transmembrane protein. So that's this stuff, right? And and um, you know, I mean, there's I, I I eliminated some of the you know the costumier and and whatever I eliminated of of but the major things here are oh it's been like cost I don't know if anybody like if you read literature sometimes it sounds like like novels sometimes people it sounds like they they're just taking biological terms and removing a couple of of letters there's a, there's a really famous um, fantasy novelist named Brandon Sanderson, whose, whose entire world takes place in this like universe called Cosmere, which is just like Costumere minus like two letters. Um, but it, the entire world takes place between this really, the, the, the sarcomere to the sarcolemma. That's not very far. Right. And so, and so I, you'll start encountering a lot of these words. Um, I, I, I don't know, it doesn't matter. That's as tangential as it gets. So, um, myosin and actin, you know that stuff, but, but, you know, titan, I want you to remember, um, cadherins, I want you to remember, and integrins, really remember integrins, really remember, uh, the integrins there. Four pathways, uh, that we went over, the PI3K, the canonical one, MAPK, that, that side road, you know, whatever, Highway 99 or, or something, and uh, DGK, phosphatidic acid, and then the stretch activated channels. Know those four. And next class, uh, we'll go over endocrine and nutrition. We'll see how far we get. I keep, I keep going way over. I just don't want to do injustice um, to, to mTOR and it's, I don't want to like, blaze through slides that require a little bit more understanding so all right what questions do you have thanks for sticking around for for these long lectures it makes it so much more rewarding to get through the material and uh, you know because all i can see is this whole screen because I don't I don't want everybody to be on the screen as I'm recording these things and like I was uncomfortable having my you know face and neck and shoulders on the whatever so I just sort of get rid of everybody and all I see is a screen and, and at the end and I, and I see a chat box but at the end when I go back to this view it's always so nice to see these sort of to see interest or at least counterfeit interest but I've bought it you know I I have I have accepted those dollars and um the curiosity the questions that come with it I'm going to do a screenshot one thing I noticed about a lot of uh professors um, that have achieved much were competitive at some point on a and on some scale they they were very aggressive and now I'm starting to get in that mindset. I'm like, I have to compete with my peers constantly. I have to have that mentality that I need to be aggressive too. Otherwise, I'll just go, oh, that was good enough. And I'll, I'll shirk by the wayside that I need to start building a foundation of uh, aggressive hunger into everything I can. And it's like, if, if the lecture's still going, don't leave. Like, you'll miss everything. Like, the last five that's, minutes. That's the how most I always was. Oh, God. Yeah, I, I, was, I was always that way. Um, but even when I've been a Pacific professor, I've I've audited classes from other professors while I've been here because like, well, they know something I don't. I'm going to go sit in on it. And I mean, I've always sat in on Van Ness's classes just to have some, you know, he, he talks about cardiovascular phys and as you well know, I'm horrible at that. And, and I, it's nice to just sit in the back of the room and, and work when he's lecturing. I mean, I'm not doing it now because I'm not going to like sit in my kitchen while he's lecturing, but, but I've always been that way. And I think, you know, I'm not saying like I'm successful, but, but people who, who clear the hurdles, uh, whatever you define success as, if, if you go from, um, you know, point A to career, um, people who hit those hurdles, it's never I've, I mean, I have zero exceptions to this. It is never the person who is checking boxes. Well, I had to take the, I had to pass the test or I had to memorize something for a test. Like I've never seen that person succeed. And 
I mean, we're talking like we have 408 students now. You know, I have, we have so many graduates that I've that I've watched um, go into the into the workforce, and and the people who are only here for the test, they just they're like the unemployment rates are stunning, and um, career satisfaction is is upsetting. And I'm on their team. Right? I want people to succeed, and the the people who are who are doing who are engaged uh, with curiosity and and competition, like let's just put those two in. Of you know, I have to I have to compete with my peers, and I'm and I'm curious as I go. Oh, I, it doesn't honestly, it doesn't even matter what the GPA is. Those are the success stories. I mean, people don't know that. People think um, that does that, not matter though. <laughs> no, it does. Trust me, it does. Um, now you need a GPA. You have to have a GPA to back it. But if your GPA is 0.5 different and you are the, the curious, engaged, um, serious student, of which all of you are, uh, you have a 0.5 advantage. In my experience, you know, I'm, I, it's not like at every single school and every single program, every grad school all over the nation and, and whatever. But in my, okay. Um, here, let me, while well, I'm not sharing my screen, let me look at my letter of rec folder just to see how many I have. Um, I'm, I have seven to do right now. I'm seven behind. I was hoping to get some of them done this weekend, but. Does it take like 30 seconds to actually render like how many files you actually have in that? Yeah, in that I'm, just, I'm just doing an info on, my, <laughs> on, the, on the thing. Um, 456. Now I've been here for a little under six years and I've written now, a couple of those are like, I've written multiple for one student where I, you know, I, the next year they have to apply somewhere else. I applied to this school. I didn't get in next year. I'm applying to, I just sort of updated a little bit, but I saved it as a new letter. So 456, let's say it's 400 unique ones. Like uh, that's a lot of students to have watched go unique students to have watched go into the workforce. Now I'm not into the thousands. My sample, you know, the size of it is actually sort of small relative to the Van Nesses of the world who have seen I don't know, 10,000, 12,000 students go from graduation into the workforce and see who succeeds and who doesn't. Um, you know, I have 400 unique, let's say, letters of rec. And what is my impression? Curiosity is maybe a 0.42 of a GPA. that you, you can get hammered on a GPA and if you have a special research too is, is a major, um, but there's multi-collinearity, there's, there's shared explanatory power and research and curiosity and, and all these different domains. Uh, but the nature of a student is, is not as important as a GPA, but man, is it big, is it important? And that's a, a compliment I hope you all receive and you continue on, on that on that route because it really does matter. Look at the, the, the most passionate, the curiosity makes people, uh, that's where education comes from. If you're not curious, you don't remember anything. And you just, you have to memorize for the test and you, and you hate it. And like, what is with all this information? Why is there so much information? Because that's a good thing. That's why there's so much information is, is as you go through life, you realize how valuable information is and, and the ease of access of information. If, if I were a shitty professor who didn't care about students, all I would do is like, all right, let's do like a half hour lecture and then everyone gets an A. That's the worst, that's just condemning people. That's just like, here's hell, get ready for it, but you're gonna, you're gonna like the way it feels and root. Um, and so the people who stick around and are genuinely engaged and, and, and learning along the way, that, that is the trajectory. Like when we were talking about the physicists, the inner physicists cal um, calculating where that ball is going to land, um, one of the variables in humanity of, of where is your career going to land is this. It's that you're here and engaged and asking questions and, 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 um, I don't know, you're, you're sort of like assembly. I mean, just the accumulation of information and um, I don't know, you get what I'm saying.
it's at the end of a day. I had, an, I had another like 90 minutes straight right before this. And so I get to this point, I get to the questions and answers section. And usually I don't know the answer and I'm ready to just go <laughs> like begin and then say whatever I can. But, uh, but also like, man, I'm, I'm far into my day. And so I, I, have, I have a hard time having anything articulate, you know, exit my mouth. Now, I do have a personal question about uh, internships next semester, so I'll leave the floor until like all other questions are answered. Anyone else have any, uh, any science-y things? All right. Um, Patrick, do you want to hop over on, on the office hour link? And I'll just, I'll just meet you over there. Oh, but give me like 15 minutes to get there. Is that okay? You, you can play your um, viola or whatever I see behind you. It's a violin. It's, it's a violin. Irish. It's a fiddle. <laughs> All right. Uh, play that for 15 minutes and then, and then I'll see you over there. I just have to wait for this to export and I have a hard time getting back online while I was doing it. So I'll see you in a few minutes and everyone else I'll see you in a couple of days.